Uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, very pleased to be here and to address you. Uh, thank you, CRTC. Thank you, IIC. Uh, this clearly has been a very difficult year for all of us. But just imagine how much more difficult it would have been without a communications infrastructure. Imagine if this had happened 25 years ago without convenient work at home, without Zoom meeting, without telemedicine, without home shopping, distance education, social media, and without streaming video. Uh, streaming video has been a game changer for uh, many media industries, a game changer for consumers and an emerging game changer for regulators in consequence. On the consumer level, total US streaming minutes have doubled per capita in the last several months. Per household, every household, it's now about 22.2 hours a week. That's more than three hours a day per household. Those are very impressive numbers. In contrast, local cable has uh, been down by 4.8%. Broadcast viewing has been down by 14%. National cable down by 16%. Today, video accounts for over 60% of uh, uh, internet uh, data traffic. Um, and in the developing world, in fact, it, uh, uh, online video might become the driver for um, broadband penetration, uh, demand-driven, demand-pull type, type uh, uh, increase of penetration as opposed to a supply push by organizations by networks, just as in the case of the mobile telecom a few years ago. So we are in the midst of a major transformation. And if the medium, online video, is indeed the message following that great Canadian, Marshall McLuhan, as he has taught us, and if these messages influence people and institutions, then today's media technologies in transformation will affect future society, culture, and economy. So uh, it's not just about the quantity of content or about convenience, any, anything, anytime, anywhere. The major fundamental change uh, in my view is the transition of TV from a slow moving, tightly controlled, standardized technology to one that is much more resembling uh, the internet and IT technology. Television has been around for 80 years or so. Uh, since the late 30s and then really uh, late 40s, uh, but it has moved fairly slowly uh, by some calculation. Uh, its compound annual growth rate, CAGR, CAGR, has been around 4% per year. And in contrast, the uh, Moore's rate for IT has been about 40% a year, 10 times as fast. What is now happening is that TV is migrating from that slow rate of change of the TV world to one that is much more closely resembling to the one prevailing the IT industry, not TV, from TV as a singular, the TV, to a plural, the various TV options, various TV technologies competing with each other for attention and market share. And this will have a lot of implications. And we're just at the beginning of, the implica of those implications. In terms of content, TV will move from models to models that are experiential, immersive, individualized, and often participatory, just like video games. Uh, of course, much of content will remain traditional, linear, uh, one way, just we have uh, been with similar uh, continuities when it comes to radio broadcasting. But the leading edge of creativity, both in terms of content and in terms of business models and in terms of technology uh, uh, and of user experience will be the new stuff. Uh, and all this has the implications. Now, the new type of TV creates new type of media companies and we have already seen who they are, Netflix and Google YouTube and Amazon um, uh, and, and others in the United States. Some of them are traditional companies, media companies. Uh, some are network companies like AT&T becoming, moving, kind of making huge bets in the content business. And similar developments occur, of course, 
uh, around the world in many countries. Uh, but uh, the main impetus and the main dynamism has for a while come uh, an expansion has come from United States companies. Uh, these trends have lots of impacts and I wish I had more time. Some are positive and I certainly wish I had more time, uh, but there are also uh, negatives, uh, which is what regulators are in particular concerned about preventing. Um, I will focus on the major problem for consumers and for competitors and for advertisers and to other countries, and that is global media power. Okay, in the United States, according to our studies, and I'm referring to two books uh, that are coming out of mine, coming out uh, in a few months with uh, uh, Edward Elgar publishing on streaming video. In the United States, the market shares uh, the concentration as measured by that HHI index, uh, and an HHI index of over 2,500 is considered to be a highly concentrated industry. For subscription video platforms, it's 3,100. For ad-based video platforms, it's 2,000. For user-generated video platforms, it's almost 3,000. For cloud computing platforms, it's over 2,600. And for internet service providers, it's 2,700. These are very high numbers. And what makes it particularly difficult to deal with is that this market power is inherent in that online streaming mediums fundamental economics. And they are based on such factors as economies of scale, network effects, data economies, economies of verticality, economies of compliance, economies of bridging, and also on distance economies. Uh, and thus these large platforms have become global and continue to do so. In the top five European uh, uh, countries, uh, the, um, the, the uh, market share of Netflix has been 52%. In the UK, it's been 58%. In France, it's been 57%. In Germany, 34%, and I could go on and on. Uh, there are obviously problems with such market power. Source diversity is reduced. Gatekeeping power is increased. Data privacy endangered. Innovation stifled. Consumer prices are rising. Prices rise for advertisers and therefore also indirectly uh, consumer goods prices are also rising. Uh, national culture is reduced and corporate censorship uh, potentially is increased. I'll talk about this in a moment, in a moment. Now, everything that I've so far mentioned, of course, you have heard, you have read, you have seen, but how does one deal with it? Again, solutions are in the air. Um, and we can discuss them. There's not enough time here. Uh, there are several solutions. One of them is breakup. One of them is behavioral regulation or a nationalization into a state operation, a public utility model. Um, and I'm discussing all these in my two forthcoming books. Let me kind of refer to the uh, breakup of online companies. Uh, in the United States, and I don't want to be parochial here, but we are in electoral campaign one of the Democratic candidates, unsuccessful candidates, but uh, influential on the progressive um, part of the Democratic uh, Party uh, is Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. She has advocated and got a lot of track, traction with it to uh, break up uh, the large online platforms. But which sounds good at some level, but if you look at it more carefully, it's her proposal is astonishingly unprincipled. Uh, take Amazon. Of Amazon, she wants to divest what? She wants to divest Zappos, which is a little sh kind of shoe uh, retailer online, and Whole Foods a retail chain. These are trivial in their own market, 3% or so, uh, and certainly uh, as part of the overall uh, Amazon empire, and certainly, the extent to which they give added power to, uh, to Amazon to have some presence in the shoe business. Um, so, so, but there's no word there of divesting AWS, the giant um, 
infrastructure platform of Amazon. Uh, there's no, nothing about uh, divesting Amazon Prime Video, the, uh, the video provider, and certainly not of the Washington Post, uh, a highly influential newspaper. Uh, so the world's largest retailer with a gazillion regulatory uh, issues in Washington owns the uh, potential megaphone in Washington that every politician reads. Um, and technically, people then say, well, it's not really Amazon, it's Jeff Bezos, the founder and CEO and primary shareholder, and it's really different, but that is a legalistic distinction without a difference. Um, so uh, similarly, no proposal is being made to, uh, to, to uh, divest all the media. Uh, AT&T isn't touched, Comcast isn't touched, Disney isn't touched, it's only the new kids on the block. And of those primarily really Facebook and Facebook politically is being hated in Washington by both the Democratic left and the Republican right. And so it's kind of a relatively face, uh, uh, safe, uh, safe target. Uh, so, but beyond the political expediency of some of these proposals uh, is the question whether a breakup will do the job. Uh, the, on, uh, the online uh, conglomerate expansion, which is indeed considerable, is the symptom of the problem, not the problem itself. Uh, because even after you strip away those acquisitions that these companies are making, you're still left with a core aspect of market power. For Google, it's search. For Facebook, it's social networking. For Amazon, it's retailing. For Disney, it's family entertainment. And for Netflix, it's, it's large user base. And, and that will not be easily addressed by divestitures and prohibitions of mergers. Those are the symptoms. Now, a second model uh, to deal with market power is self-regulation. Uh, sometimes it works, self-regulation for technology issues in particular, cooperative industry. Um, but in other cases, it's a truly bad idea. Uh, let me look at one dimension, content self-regulation. In most democratic countries, governments are limited by constitutional constraints on what content they can touch, uh, they can control, and how. Uh, and therefore, given the fact that there are unquestionably uh, problems of content on these uh, platforms, uh, they have delegated, they have started to massively delegate regulation to the platform companies, calling it self-regulation, but under government pressure and to mandate self-regulation, clean up or else. In the process, the platforms are shifting from being responsible for almost nothing to being responsible for almost everything. The platforms in some ways are going along uh, uh, in, uh, because in return, they hope to be left alone. Uh, uh, that's the deal. We will clean up and you leave us alone. I think it's a terrible system. There's no due process. There's no constitutional protection. It's based on the, on the marketing and economic and political considerations uh, of companies not to offend hypersensitive users. And it is effective by rules in one, of, in one country, by the rules of other countries' governments that might be much more, um, more um, restrictive. So in the process, we are making the big companies into the super regulators of content on the globe and of online behavior. And then we go around and complain about them having too much power. This is the wrong model. We should not give companies these powers to decide what people can see. It's got to be that people can control what information they watch and receive. So this is the alternative, strengthening user choice. But how do we do that? Uh, the key, in my view, is to enable intermediaries. Those intermediaries are between the end user and the platforms. Uh, we can call them personal information curators or something like that. Uh, because the problem has been that the end user, the, the user uh, basically are less informed, uh, less experienced, have less time. Uh, and uh, uh, in contrast to giant tech companies with their resources and expertise. Uh, and so the desirable way to go is to empower the consumers through the abilities to go through intermediary agents who have expertise, knowledge, and scale. 
so, uh, so we should be more imaginative here in creating this and try to create that intermediate layer of organizations. And this is a system of access. Uh, and I call this alternative the open video system, OVS. It's based on access, not on breakup. Uh, and uh, and uh, so these personal management curators that are picked by their uh, by users to conduct in their behalf content search, data privacy control, content filtering, selection algorithms, and pick infrastructure options. Now they're not mandatory. It can still be done by the platform, but the user has the option of easily moving to an intermediate, intermediary structure, structure. And those access arrangements would also exist for competitors or content providers, and therefore reduce the bottleneck power of the main platforms. Uh, so for example, the information curators could place privacy settings on clients' behalf, monitor what happens to data, subsequently collect royalties for the use of customer data, uh, set up various technology tools such as encryption, anonymization, and other techniques to enable the user to protect their information. Uh, they should, could, the intermediaries could search for content in behalf of the users, connect the users to it. Because right now the system, if you think about it, is crazy. You got to subscribe to seven different services for pay, plus then there are the uh, the advertising based platforms. So you could be kind of like doing passwords and all kind of arrangements and payment arrangements for easily 10 providers. Uh, why can't you go to one that basically selects for you or you select based on uh, information that they give you uh, content from whatever platforms the information the payment arrangements can be done behind the scenes. You don't have to be directly involved in them. So, uh, so the screening, uh, the provisions of uh, alternative uh, algorithms, for example, could all be uh, implemented. Now, how do we go to that system? There are basically three requirements and only three as far as I can tell. And the first one is the access rights to, to the infrastructure platforms uh, where there is significant media market power, SMMP. Okay, so it doesn't go to every mom and pop. It goes only where there is significant media market power. And those access rights are to users, to rivals, and to those intermediaries. Second requirement, that that access would be accomplished through APIs, Applications Program Interfaces, so basically an access code arrangements that enables outside parties to enter parts, segmented parts of the software of the, um, of the platforms. Um, and the third, uh, uh, in the case of platforms with SMMP, and the third requirement is that conditions of access would be governed by non-discriminatory principle of most favored nation, subject to arbitration by a self-administrative process. So this would be a self-regulatory process on the pricing and access conditions. Now these intermediaries could be multiple type of organizations. They could be for-profit companies. They could be charitable organization, ideological organizations with a different definite perspective for its adherence. It could be some cooperative of consumers. It could be advertising based. It could be commission payment. It could be subsidized. There are various ways in which this could work. Now, um, let me then come, come to the conclusion here. Uh, how to deal with market power in online TV is Im truly important for future, um, uh, for future uh, consumer level, for the provider level, for the competitors, and even for the platforms themselves. Because if there's lots of unhappiness, as is emerging now, there will be regulations. The regulations might be over restricted. There might be nationalistic based. There might be industrial policy based. Who knows? It is better to have a system that is transparent, user choice based, rather than to have market power uh, in an excessive way. And so this would reduce gatekeeping power over content. It would strengthen technology innovation. It would lower prices, increase consumer choices. Yes, there will be a somewhat greater complexity, but it is not going to be 
uh, it, that is not going to overwhelm uh, the major advantages. Um, and so, so this is the, the recommendation that I'm making. It does not touch platform without market power. It does not break up. It does not require platform to act as the policeman for governments to do things that governments have no right to do themselves. It gives market access rights to interoperation of software modules to intermediaries who act on behalf of the end users. It does not solve all problems, but it reduces the problem of global market power. And it does so without the inefficiency and anti-innovation aspects of the other approaches. So we should give our attention uh, as regulators in thinking to establishing such a system. It would be the foundation of the future media industry and media policy for a long time. And the time for think about it is here and now and today. And I hope that we can work about uh, on this together, refine it um, and make it happen. And I do thank you for your attention. Thank you.